Hello, my name is Emily Jansen, and this is the Leadership is Female podcast. I am a female leader in sports. I'm the general manager of a AAA baseball team in minor league baseball, and I'm the first woman to hold this title in nearly 20 years. And I am here with the Leadership is Female podcast to make sure that this amount of time never goes by again before another woman leads. Marion Wright Edelman said, you can't be what you can't see. So I am here to interview successful women in sport to uncover opportunity, learn the tips, learn from our mistakes, learn from our successes to get you to the top faster. Join me and my guests week after week, season after season, as we reach back to extend a hand to pull you forward. I will lead her forward because leadership is female. On today's podcast, we speak with Rachel Luba, MLB player agent who's responsible for the negotiation of the historic Trevor Bauer contract. Among arbitration eligible players, Trevor became the second highest paid starting pitcher in history. Rachel was the first woman who negotiated a contract for a player on the 25 man roster. Rachel is a dynamo. She'll share with us that time and time again, she did not take no for an answer. When faced with a crossroads, quit or face confrontation and do the work, she took the challenge to face confrontation and do the work. She's an example of hard work and determination that it does indeed pay off. Also, listen to how often she used negotiation to propel her career forward. She's got some tips for you, and it's a great reminder that if we can sharpen our negotiation skills, it's a huge benefit and can put you in the fast lane to career growth. I'm honored to have Rachel Luba on episode six of the Leadership is Female podcast. As I always say, grab a pen and get ready to take some notes because this is a good one. Today on the Leadership is Female podcast, we are so excited to have Rachel Luba. A former UCLA gymnast turned competitive boxer, Rachel Luba knows what it takes to compete at the highest levels. After passing the bar exam, Luba worked as a salary arbitration attorney at the MLBPA, where she helped take a record number 22 cases to hearing, winning 12 against the teams. Luba launched her own agency in 2019, becoming the youngest female MLB agent and starting the first ever female-owned agency. During her first off-season as a player agent, Luba negotiated her first contract worth $17.5 million for starting pitcher Trevor Bauer, making him the second highest paid salary arbitration eligible pitcher in history. Wow, incredible, incredible bio of Rachel Luba, and we are so excited to have her here. Rachel, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, so um, in your own words, can you tell us who you are, what you do, and how you got there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So, I mean, you gave me my whole bio, um, but just to kind of recap, um, I am a player agent for baseball players. And um, I'm also an attorney. And my path to getting here um, was definitely uh, an uphill battle for sure, and continues to be. But, um, you know, I've, it's been probably 10 years in the making that I really set out on becoming an agent in baseball. And, you know, this is my first year finally getting to do it. So it's exciting. Um, just to, I guess, give you a little background on, you know, when I started um, or when I kind of decided this is really what I want to do. And that goes back to my freshman year at UCLA. Um, I did gymnastics there and lived on the same, uh, the same floor as a bunch of the UCLA baseball players. I grew up with three brothers, so I was used to, you know, hanging around, being around guys all the time. And, you know, I started thinking, I knew that as a gymnast, you know, your career as a gymnast ends basically the, the latest you can really go is through college and then you need to have a different career. Um, so I always knew that gymnastics wasn't going to be my like future monetary kind of career going forward. So I needed to think of other things. And obviously growing up as a gymnast, I did it since I was two years old, sports for my life. Um, I always knew I wanted to work in sports. And as I started to think more about this, once I got to college, um, you know, I realized that my passion was in helping the individual athlete. 
And I think a lot of this was because the fact that I was always an individual sport athlete. Um, I never really was a part of a team. Obviously college was somewhat team oriented, um, but it was never, I just was never drawn to being on the team side, which I would say probably a majority of people are. That tends to be the more, you know, the, the side that people want to work on. Um, but however, for me, it was more just helping the individual athletes. So this idea of, you know, becoming an agent, um, you know, started sounding really interesting to me. Um, and then basically I kind of made this decision and, you know, started, you know, hanging out with the baseball players and getting to learn more about their sport and how everything worked. And there's not a lot of money in gymnastics. So I knew, you know, being an agent in gymnastics wasn't, um, wasn't really a possibility or something that was kind of worth pursuing. But, you know, one of the big four sports, NHL, NBA, NFL, MLB were kind of where I had my sight set. Um, and then, you know, I basically I asked at one point I asked a player uh, that I was good friends with if, you know, I could just pick his or pick his agent's brain and kind of see what you know, if you had any advice or recommendations, because that's kind of what you're taught when you're younger and, you know, you think you know what you want to do or you have some ideas and interests, you know, you should always talk to people who work in that industry. So that's what I did. And I went, I remember to the office of this agent in LA and I sat down with him and I kind of told him briefly, you know, this is, I think I'm really passionate about this, really what I want to do. And uh, you know, he just kind of looked at me and with this very arrogant kind of look on his face, just leaned back in his chair, kicked his feet up and just kind of looked at me and I just stared at him and he was like, you're a girl. And then the staring continued as I was like, yeah, you know, well aware. Thank you. Um, and I just looked confused. I think at that point I was like, is that it? He's like, well, what I'm saying is you're not really welcome in the industry. Um, and then I just, you know, I'm sure my facial expression at that point was very um, now annoyed. And he was like, I'm not saying you can't do it. It's just the reality. It's a boys club. And, you know, that's just the landscape of the industry. I was like, okay, man, like, thanks. Um, so basically I was like, is that all you, is that all you have for me? And he, um, you know, he's like, listen, if, if you want any credibility at all, he goes, my biggest advice, he's going to be, he was like, get a law degree. But yeah. And I was like, great. All right. You know, walked out of there. Um, I remember texting the player and who, you know, set up this whole meeting. And I was like, guess what? I was like, I'm applying to, I'm going to apply to law school. And that was literally what did it? I had never thought about law school before that. Um, I was just like, yeah, makes sense. Um, I, I think the agent thought that that would just dissuade me um, from, you know, wanting to do it, but that was just, all right, that's the next stepping stone. And to be fair, I didn't just, you know, without thinking it through, like, I'm going to go to law school. You know, I really thought about what he said and kind of why he felt that way, why he thought I wouldn't have credibility. And, you know, as much as it sucks and as much as I wish that that wasn't the reality of kind of the world we live in, that I need to have a law degree in order to have credibility, it, it made sense to me because you have all these players who, regardless of, I helped a lot of players in school and helped them with their schoolwork and all of that. But at the end of the day, you know, if they graduate, they both have, they have the degree from UCLA just like I do. And they've played baseball their entire life. So what makes them think that I have any sort of authority to represent them and to represent their best interest and to be someone that they, you know, trust to handle their career when, you know, we have technically the same degree and I've never played the sport. And so, you know, I really thought about it and I was like, all right, this is a huge investment, but, um, I'm going to do it. And, you know, I applied to law school. I wrote all my personal statements about that, um, about how I want to be a baseball agent and that apparently this is what a female needs is a law degree. Um, I made it very clear that I never intended to, you know, 
um, practice traditional law or anything like that. And, you know, a lot of professors along the way in law school um, tried over and over to convince me to consider law. Um, my parents, when I was unemployed, um, after having passed the bar exam for, you know, eight months, um, tried to convince me that, you know, maybe I should in the meantime, like, go be a lawyer. Um, but I've always kind of been someone that I, if I have my sights set on something, um, you know, I will it's very hard to get me to, you know, give up or divert, but I will go through the misery of it just to make sure that I achieve it. And especially the more and more people tell me I can't do it, the more I'm determined to prove them wrong. Yeah. I mean, incredible story, first of all, and congratulations because you left out the fact that you graduated top of your class and early from law school as well. So not only did you prove that guy wrong, um, but you absolutely aced it in law school. So you, that is so inspiring. Um, you, you turned a negative situation into something that was so positive for you and really laid the groundwork for your career. So fast forward a little bit and you decide to start your own agency. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about Luba Sports and what you do and uh, who you represent and how you really, really nailed that first contract. Yeah, so I ended up, I actually ended up getting a job um, after, again, eight months of being an unemployed uh, lawyer. I got a job um, working as an attorney at doing salary arbitration contracts for the MLBPA, which is the Players Association. Um, and really got to learn this kind of unique process and aspect of athlete representation or base for baseball players that to be honest, most agents don't really know about. Um, most agents don't really understand it. Uh, most agents hire what we call expert agent advisors that the union kind of provides for, and they're the ones who handle players when they go through salary arbitration. So it was this really unique kind of thing. And I realized one that I needed to have, I needed to become an expert in something that was different, that was unique, that, you know, really helped me, you know, break into the industry. So salary arbitration seemed like something it was, you know, right up the being a lawyer, like wheelhouse, something I was interested in. So I really got to learn that. Um, and so I got a job doing that. And as I was at, you know, working at the MLBPA, and I had also interned while in law school at an agency, a traditional agency for baseball. And so I got to see, you know, the inner workings of that. And then I got to see the inner workings at the MLBPA. And the MLBPA, really, you get to see the full gamut of it, the good, the bad, the ugly of agencies. And the in the beginning, I'll be honest with you, these guys that I put up on a pedestal that I thought, you know, they're the end all be all, they made it in life. They were agents. I started to realize like some of these big names, they were calling the union asking questions about things that I was like, kind of shocked. Like, you should know that, you know, you're one of the biggest agents, but you know, they don't. And so it, it kind of started giving me confidence. Like if these guys can do it, first of all, if these guys don't clearly have it all figured out, like they're one group of them, then I can do it. And two, there were some people that I was just like, wow, like they're representing players. So if they can do it. I can, I can <laughs> never do this. Like there is nothing at this point that like, has made me, I, I am extra confident at this point that I have the ability just like these guys do to do that same job. Um, and so I started thinking more about it and I was knocking on, you know, my time. I really wanted to do that as well. So I wasn't done once I was as an attorney at the union, I wasn't just going to kind of stop there. I really wanted to be an agent. This was my way of kind of going back, um, uh, in getting experience that was super unique and then becoming an agent. And the, you know, I continued to network and I obviously got to know all these agents and they, you know, they all respected me and my knowledge, but at the end of the day, 
no one, my, my gender was always polarizing and no one would pull the trigger on it. It was either, I mean, from you had the people that would tell me to my face, there is no chance that a female can be an agent. It's just, it's not going to work. So you would have those people and then you would have the ones that were like, wow, it's really unique. And this could really set us apart. And that bothered me because one, I don't want to be your token female there. Like I, I want you to want me because I'm going to do just as good of a job, if not better than all these other guys that work for you. But, you know, even still it was like, okay, so they think this is really unique, but you, like nobody would ever just take the plunge and, you know, offer me something. They were so hesitant about it. And so I kind of, you know, I've always believed that, you know, if you don't, like, if people don't want to, you know, welcome you into their company or, you know, give you an, an opportunity or a chance, like, do it yourself and compete against them. And that was kind of what I started thinking about doing. And I also, the more and more I thought about it and I saw really how much time agents were spending negotiating these contracts, it made me realize that there's got to be a better way to do this, you know, and from my, my legal background where I learned, you know, in law school, you learn all about billable hours and you charge clients, you know, based on the work that you do and the value of your service. And I started get I started thinking like, you know, why, why aren't agent, why don't agents charge that way? You know, how they're able to take a percentage of a contract that nowadays with especially with how analytics are and how front offices operate the value is pr is pretty set in stone you know they're it the way they value players players now is very different than how they did you know even five ten years ago and so a lot of this value there's a there's a range where you can you know move it and you know push it up a little bit but in general the value is created by the player on the field so why are the agents getting to take a cut of that. And so I started thinking, you know, why won't it work that I can just do and have an agency that operates like a law firm and you pay for the value of the service that I provide rather than the, the value of the performance that you have created. And, you know, I talked to people in the industry. I talked to a lot of the senior attorneys at the MLBPA about it. And I was like, why hasn't this been done? And they would all kind of smile and they're like, well, you know, look, the industry's ripe for it. Just like, why aren't there really females? Like, who knows? Because there just aren't. And I decided that, you know, they kind of said, they were like, look, it's just going to take the right person. And no one's really had the incentive to go and blackball themselves and do something that undercuts an entire industry or whatever. And I kind of just looked at it and figured, you know, my gender already is seeming to, seems to blackball me and is already an issue. So, you know, I have this unique experience of really understanding, you know, salary arbitration and I, you know, I can do it. I can do this, do it a better way and kind of go on my own if no one's going to give me a chance. Um, so I ended up, you know, going and passing the agent exam and starting my own agency and I had, you know, talked for, for years kind of about this idea as it was forming um, to Trevor Bauer, who I knew from UCLA. Uh, we had a class together my freshman year, you know, became good friends. And he was always one of those people that really, you know, if I ever had a question about baseball, he would answer it. And never, I never got that kind of I like patronizing or like eye roll that a lot of men will give when you ask them a question because in the beginning I never knew what was like a dumb question for base like for people that knew baseball and what wasn't and he always just gave me an answer and so he was always really supportive always told you know kind of would talk to him about it and the more um you know I started talking to him about this idea he's obviously a very progressive kind of forward thinking guy and he really saw the value in it and he realized it was a more efficient way to do it and decided to uh, put his trust in me and let me represent him um, so that was my first obviously most people don't start um, be, as an agent with a super high profile client like that they might have a really high profile draft drafty you know or player that's in the draft but then it takes several years before they even break in and then have to negotiate a contract. And that's, that's the first time that an agent normally would get any money. 
So to just right off the bat be thrown into it um, was definitely, was a rush um, and different, but um, it was exciting. And, you know, I, I was nervous because I knew that, you know, I have to, I have to get this one right because it's my first one. All eyes are on me because I even had, there was a story that came out about it. Um, one of the writers, Ken Rosenthal wrote about it, which we never leaked it. Someone else did. I was planning on announcing my big like announcement of um, starting an agency after I negotiated his contract. Um, but somehow someone else leaked it and the writers wanted to talk about it. And I was told from multiple agents that that was the most press that any agent has ever gotten um, for, you know, getting a client, a new, like a client to leave their agency to come to them and to start an agency. Obviously that probably has a lot to do with the fact that one, I was a female and two, that it's Trevor Bauer who mm -hmm. knows how to always end up in the media. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So it was, um, there was a lot of pressure there, but, um, you know, I, I knew at the end of the day, um, like I, I know how to do this. I know what I'm doing and, um, yeah, it went well. Yeah. Well, you absolutely nailed it on your, your first go. Um, no surprises there too, because in getting to know you in a couple of conversations, you have a fire and a competitiveness that, um, just leads you to success. Um, I think you're a definition of the hard work uh, really, really pays off. So can you share with us the record that you, you set in negotiating Trevor's contract? Yeah, so he, the record, so he's now like the second highest paid pitcher to ever go through salary arbitration. Um, and so we ended up you know, getting him a deal for 17 and a half million plus potential award bonuses. Um, and, you know, it was, you know, I remember um, the union actually was telling me because he had a, the two years prior, he had gone to hearing um, and going to hearing is super risky because, you know, there's two different numbers that you could end up, I mean, there was one year Trevor was basically risking he could gain, if he won his hearing, he would basically get 100000 more than what his final offer was before we had to go to hearing. But if he lost, he would have lost $1.1 million oh, below wow. his final offer. So it's really risky, right? So the union has always been a little, um, they clearly don't like his risk tolerance. And, they, and then going back to back and winning back to back is very rare. So this idea in their head that he was going to go three times and then the problem was the second time he won um the year prior so he had won but the mlb was so upset about it <laughs> that they fired the entire panel because there were a lot of issues they don't they're not big fans of trevor so they fired his entire panel which sets i mean that sets the tone that basically if another there's a lot of politics in it and there was a very good chance that no panel a third time after the three before that lost their jobs, that a panel the third time would rule in Trevor's favor. And to be honest, you know, Trevor didn't have the greatest season either. So the union was very much trying to persuade me to, you know, look, anything you can basically get a little above what he got paid this last year is good. Take it. Like we, we cannot end up in a hearing. And you know, I understood where they were coming from. I also knew that, you know, and I had been in their shoes. I had been at the union in their position, that exact position with other agents, right? Where, you know, you don't want them to end up in a hearing because that's, you know, you understand the risks. And, but that one thing I always believed in when I was at the union was that at the end of the day, as long as the player truly understands the risks, we work for the player it's not our decision. And if the player understands what the risks are, then, you know, you, like, you give them your advice, what you think is best and what you recommend. But at the end of the day, if they want to go to hearing, you go and you put on the best case that you can for your client. And so I knew, like, look, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not just going to take something that I don't think is fair for Trevor because I don't want to end up in a hearing. And of course, I don't want to go to a hearing and lose my first 
time ever and you know as representing a player and that my record now is that and you know Mm -hmm. it just doesn't look good but at the same time I'm not going to take a I'm not going to let them know that they can just give me offer some crappy deal because I'm scared so um the union was a little worried that we were going to end up in another hearing um but you know I had confidence I I understood like the new team that he was with the relationship that he had there how they felt about him and you know I was able to you know figure out kind of how to you know position ourselves in a way such that we could get him what I felt was a more than fair deal um and you know make them feel like this was a win too because we kept everybody out of a hearing room and you know the teams don't necessarily want to go to hearing either so you know it was kind of a balance of how do i you know manipulate that and um frame it in the right way so that it's it's a win-win um but yeah it ended up you know being way better than i think anybody expected especially at the union they were very surprised pleasantly surprised when we told them our number um and yeah Hey, just a quick break to remind you to head on over to emilyjansen.com to download your free copy of the top 10 myths about being a female leader in sports. This guide will debunk the top myths and lead you to the top. This guide will show you what's possible to achieve in life while having an incredible career in sports. Head on over to Emily Jansen, that's J-A-E-N-S-O-N.com and grab your copy. It's free. Now let's get back to this great interview. So impressive. And in the negotiation, and, and you shared so much about your thought process going into it and sort of how, how you would navigate um, the negotiation. And thank you so much for sharing. It's not only interesting, but I think also really helpful um, as people enter negotiations working in the front office or um, really in any facet of your life, really understanding how to navigate that successfully is so important. Um, So Rachel, can you identify a specific tipping point in your career? So I think I would say one of the biggest ones for me was at, so I competed in law school at the salary arbitration competition that Tulane Law School puts on every year. It's really big. And when I was looking into law schools that I wanted to go to, I specifically wanted to make sure that they competed in that competition because it was the only thing relevant to baseball. Um, So, you know, I eagerly tried to get on my first year on the team, was told by our sports law professor that you have to be a second year, you know, law student. You can't do it your first year. But she was like, you know, you can sit in to the, you know, the practices and learn about it. I was like, all right, I was that, that, you know, first time student. Um, And my second year, I made it onto the team. And when I went to compete there, um, I remember, so my judge was, he was this expert agent advisor and he was one of the guys that was there judging. And I remember, well, first of all, like in the middle of my presentation, he, he kind of would stop me and quiz me to, it was almost like to double check. I really understood the arguments I was making and it bothered me a little because I was like, at first I was just, I thought that was normal. Okay. And then the other side went the three guys on the other side. And first of all, they had stats that were just blatantly wrong. Like they just, wrote them down wrong and he didn't stop them until the end he let them know that they were by the way you know you messed up it's actually like you know his era was a three five not a three eight and whatever um but never stopped them or anything but mine it was like he was like it was it wasn't even just it was quizzing me on you know a point i made and then he finishes it up with he was like all right guys and then stopped and he looked at me and he goes oh wait and girl girls, right? He goes, I'm sorry, were you offended when I said guys? And I was like, what? Like, no, I, I say guy. like, are you kidding me right now? And it was just super awkward. And I was very annoyed at that point. And whatever, that was that kind of moment, that experience. And then the next, the last day they have a panel and they do a raffle before and they have like a, the panel of all the judges kind of talk and there's Q and A. So I'm at that and my partner who was on my team, he had, he bought me a raffle ticket 
and I end up winning the signed Fergie Jenkins picture. So I go up to claim it and that judge is standing right there and he has his wallet out and he was like, here, he goes, I'll give you 20, I'll give you $20 and like, can I have that? And as if like I had no use, like I wouldn't be excited or something because I'm a girl, like, you know, why would I want to sign for a Jenkins picture? And just like the way he went about it, I, again, I was already annoyed at this guy. And I was like, um, I, what, no, why? And he was like, look, fair market value for this is $20. I'm, I'll give you $20 for it and like, let's call it a day. And I sat there and thought for a sec and I was like, um, he goes, listen, I got a panel to do. And then I, like, I got to go, I have to leave early for my flight to catch my flight. So are we like, can we do this or what? And I was like, I mean, let me sit down and think about it a little. And then, you know, on your way out, just signal to me and like, I'll let you know if I want to do the deal. So I go back to my seat and I tell my like partner and he was like, Rachel, you gotta do something bold. Like this guy does not like take you seriously at all. So I went and looked it up online and I realized that the fair market value of it was, uh, what was it? Uh, $50. So I was now even more annoyed at this guy. And <laughs> I thought about it for a sec. I was like, okay. And he's signaling to me the entire panel, like looking at me, trying to make sure that like, I'm making eye contact. Like, we going to do this? Like, we good? And I was like, why do you want this? So like, I'm just so confused at this point. Why do you want it so badly? And I'm bothered by the fact that you don't think I would want it. And so anyways, he starts to leave. I meet him out back and he was like, all right, so, and I just looked at him. I was like, okay, listen, fair market value for it is $50. So like either you pay me a hundred for it or give me an internship or no deal. And I keep the Fergie Jenkins signed picture. And he literally just like his eye, his whole demeanor, everything changed about him. And he was like, okay kind of smiled, picked out, like grabbed his wallet, pulls out a hundred dollar bill and pulls out his business card. And he was like, let's talk. Like, and he has been, we are very close. He's been probably the most influential person in my career to this day. Um, I wouldn't be where I am in my career. I wouldn't have gotten that job. He was, he actually gave me an opportunity to create an entire database of salary arbitration cases, which nobody's ever gone through no one, no one today has ever seen every po like past hit arbitration case, but he gave me the resources in order to, to help, like even for the union to create a database for him, um, before this was when I was unemployed in order to kind of give me some experience, which was how I even got the job then at the union as an attorney. So he's, he's been the most influential person in my career, but and, and I, yeah, I wouldn't be where I am without him today. And we are very close friends, but it made me realize that that was a long story and I apologize, but as a female, like sometimes you have to be bold. Like you have to do something that people aren't expecting because if you don't, nobody's going to take you seriously. If you don't put yourself out there, it's why I'm very, like, I try to be very big on social media and I know it's, you know, a lot of people kind of are, a little taken aback by it in this industry because it's not how people act in this industry, but it's, it's how, it's the only way that I don't just, you know, get left behind and forgotten about. Like you have to be bolder and bigger than everybody else or else, you know, you kind of just get passed over. And that story gave me goosebumps, first of all, and just the way you told it and the turn of events. And again, like this is another turning point, tipping point, whatever you want to call it in your story, where you took the high road. You could have walked away with your tail between your legs and you took the high road and you faced that challenge head on. And it turned out to be, again, that one moment, one of um, uh, the biggest moments of your career where you could have been defeated by the way this man was treating you. Right. But instead, you you took the situation and you turned it on your head. And there's a couple other points that you made that I just have to point out. The first one was that you do your research. You're always doing your research. Even selecting law school, you made sure that the school you were attending had exactly what you needed in order to get where you needed to go. Having a very specific goal allowed you to make that decision and then choose your school accordingly. 
And then there was also another thing in there so important is that you take the time to stop and think about things. And I think so often we're super rushed. We feel rushed to make a decision. We feel rushed to answer an email. We feel rushed to give people an answer. And with this guy, you, instead of feeling rushed to give him an answer and exchange the money and walk away feeling confused or uncertain of it, if it was the right choice, you just stopped, took a step back and then came up with the right plan. And I think that is such a lesson for all of us. Well, I, I think so many times, and trust me, it was a moment for me where initially I was, I, to be, to be fair, I think the pan, the fact that there was a panel about to start kind of almost forced me into that position because I was like, well, I'm not making this decision right now. So, and like, you have to do it. So I'll just do it after. I, like, I'll be honest. I don't think that I, I don't know how it would have played out if there wasn't some event that was about to start that I had to almost like, it had to resume after. But as I'm like walking back to my chair, yeah, I realized like, I like, think about this, take this opportunity because this is a moment. And you know, people have told me that when you go to these competitions and these things, how you finish in it, how you do, they're so subjective and silly, to be honest, but it's the people you meet there and the connections you make that are going to be important. And I knew this guy was an important person in the baseball industry. And so it was, you know, even though I wasn't getting the responses I wanted from him initially and kind of the, you know, treatment that I wanted, you know, I knew like, look, this is how it's going to be to break into the industry. So, you know, just trying to take each moment and how do I make this you know, better. But I think in life in general, we are very pressured into just responding to things quickly and jumping to an answer. And I think sometimes we forget that it's just because social media and, you know, giving responses is so just so much at our fingertips now that we feel like it has to be instantaneous. Most things, most offers or most opportunities don't disappear in 60 seconds. You know, you don't need to give an answer in 60 seconds or make a decision in 60 seconds. A lot of times, and if it does, it probably wasn't something that was going to be that beneficial for you to begin with. You know, this guy clearly wanted the Fergie Jenkins picture. And I like, don't worry, like I got the full ration or like explanation as to why this was so important. But it, it was clear to me at that moment that this was very important to him because, you know, the way he was at the, on the panel kept looking at me like, this means something. So because it means something like now I'm going to take a moment to think about it. Like I have an opportunity to, I have leverage now because I have something that is very valuable to him clearly. And so, you know, just kind of finding leverage in, in all the ways that you can. The expert negotiator for <laughs> sure. <laughs> so can you tell us uh, your biggest hurdle that you've had in your career so far and uh, how you've overcome that? I would say it would be the, just the fact that, I mean, one, I'm a female and two, I never played baseball. I didn't grow up with, you know, I spent my life in the gym. So I didn't grow up you know, going to games and my parents teaching me about the game. I knew the very basics of baseball. And so, you know, I made this decision that I was, I was really interested in how the industry operated and I really connected with the players. I felt like I, you know, I could do a really good job representing them. But at the end of the day, I didn't have that baseball experience and knowledge and just, you know, foundation. And gaining that was, a huge hurdle. One, it's a hurdle whether you're a guy or a girl, because to learn an entire sport, I mean, you have to, it, that's hard. It's hard to do, to learn an entire industry, not just the rules of the game, but everything that goes into it, how players train, you know, everything. But then you add on the fact that I was a female and people knew that, okay, this was a goal of mine. I want to be an agent. There was just this stigma to it that, you know, what are you doing? Like, you, you don't know baseball, like, how are you going to do this? And then no guy wanted to, most guys, 
it was like anything I asked about baseball, like I was saying earlier, I would get these answers or these eye rolls or, you know, I can't believe you don't know that or, ugh, you know, girls don't know anything about sports or whatever. And so it was finding people I think that I could trust that would teach me the game and that I felt like I could go and ask whatever about, you know, anything I wanted about baseball and they would explain it to me. And, you know, I never, there was no judgment. Um, and, you know, I found there was a pitching coach at UCLA who was super helpful and he ended up, he's a scout now for the twins. He would take me to minor league games and we would sit at games and he would tell me, you know, everything that he's looking for with like, you know, viewing a game through the eyes of a scout. And so just trying to learn everything. But I think, you know, I realized I had this, there was this kind of insecurity that I had about the fact that I don't, I didn't know the sport that well. And it, it kind of made me, you know, I realized like I need to learn it, but I need to learn it almost. I, I realized like if I'm scared to ask, if I don't know what is even considered a stupid question, then I just need to know everything. And so I ended up, you know, almost like most agents, I probably have more knowledge just overall now of baseball and everything from like advanced stats that most of them, I mean, I could, I would spend, you know, night after night on fan graphs reading articles about, you know, different stats and how they created them and things like that, which most, you know, agents don't even know. But I like, I knew I had to be overqualified because I'm a female and because I didn't play. So I think that was the biggest hurdle was, you know, getting that knowledge and then feeling, but then feeling confident now that like, I know baseball and, you know, believing that I, you know, I know my, sh I know my stuff. Thank you so much for being so honest to share all of that. And um, also an understanding that if, if you have a deficiency somewhere, or even if you don't, you can never know everything and you have to continue to be a curious learner to stay at the top of your game. 100%. So I want to ask you what advice you have for women, um, for women who work in sports. Um, what are sort of the top, top couple of tips that, that you can share? Um, I guess the biggest ones would be, I mean, one, just you, you got to be, you got to be one, you can do it. Like, don't ever let the, the gender thing get in the way. If you want to do it, do it. Not saying it's going to be easy at all, but you know, you, there is a way. The second thing is that you're going to have to be overqualified. It's going to bother you. It's going to be frustrating. You're going to see all a bunch of other people in the industry working next to you that didn't have to, you know, work nearly as hard or prove themselves nearly as much, but like you got to accept it and do it and be overqualified. And then I think I talked about this, I think in the, um, that meeting we had, um, with the other Reno aces, but I think it was a kind of big, uh, like realization for me when I realized that I mean, one, you want to soak up as much as you can when you're around people that you know have a lot of knowledge about something. And so just listen. But I got into this habit of just listening and then, you know, waiting. Like I would see all these guys giving their opinions on a situation and nobody ever asked me, but they would ask everybody else. And I was like an employee. It wasn't like I was just an intern. Like I was an employee there. I was an attorney or some, you know, whatever. And I realized that in especially just in the beginning if as a female i think you have to be a you have to be okay with speaking up because again in the beginning i think it's more so like this but nobody is going to ask your opinion if you're quiet they'll just let you be quiet throughout the whole meeting they won't ask what you think about it so if you want and a lot of times like women and men have great ideas. So, you know, it's great to get everybody's opinion on something, but for whatever reason, they don't seem to just naturally, you know, go to the women or to the woman and ask what she thinks about it. And so I think it's getting comfortable with and used to just having to speak up and assert yourself. And 
you know, again, as long as like, you know, you have a valid point to make, then then make, don't wait for them to ask you. That, those are awesome, awesome top three. So to wrap it up, um, I asked this question to everybody. What is your favorite quote? I wrote, I wrote, I wrote this one down because I, this is my favorite one. I don't know who said it, um, but it is the people who succeed look around for the opportunities that they need. And if they can't find them, they create them. And I love that one because that is how I pretty much have had to live my life of, you know, if the opportunity is not there, then create it. I think you could have that on the back of your business card. That is incredible. Rachel, Luba, what a phenomenal interview. How can we stay in touch with you? Where can we find you? Tell us about your podcast. And uh, we want to stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, love getting to talk to other, you know, successful women in the industry um, and help younger ones that want to come up. Um, I, so I do have a podcast, um, produced by Momentum Films and it is called Corked Up. It's with Jess Kleinschmidt. And, um, so you can find us there on at Corked Up. We're on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and then I'm on Instagram personally at Rachel.Luba and I'm on Twitter. Um, my handle there is at Agent Rachel Luba. Awesome. Well, we can't wait to keep in touch and follow your tremendous success. Thank you so much for being on the Leadership is Female podcast. Thank you for having me. Home run interview with Rachel Luba, MLBPA certified player agent at Luba Sports LLC. After hearing from Rachel, I think it's evident that her favorite quote, the people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, make them. It's abundantly true in Rachel's life. Take some advice, get out there and make it happen. With that, let's get into the top four takeaways from Rachel Luba. Seek out and talk to people who are in the industry you want to be a part of. Be curious, ask questions, be passionate. Number two, do your research. Have a specific goal in mind and choose the road that is the most direct path to achieving that goal like Rachel did when she selected the right law school. Number three, be a great listener. Soak up knowledge and listen, but don't be afraid to contribute. Use your voice. If you have a seat at the table, you have done the work and your opinion matters too. Speak up in meetings and share your thoughts. And number four, if they can do it, you can do it. Build your confidence. Be bold. Put yourself out there. You can do it. There is a way. If people don't want to give you the chance, do it yourself. Then compete against them. Is that powerful or what? Hey everyone, if you're wondering how I record my podcast, Leadership is Female, I use Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple, and many more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hey you, did you join my email list? I want to stay in touch with you so that you'll have the heads up on new podcast episodes and get the tips you are looking for to empower you to level up. It's easy to sign up. Head on over to emilyjansen.com. I'm so excited you are here and I can't wait to help lead you forward in the career of your dreams. Again, that's Emily J A E N S O N.com. Thank you for listening to the Leadership is Female podcast. It means the world to me that you chose to spend your time with this podcast today. If you like this episode, subscribe, share, and review. What can you do today to lead her forward? We will do our part to lead her forward because leadership is female. Thank you for joining us.